Lowe's Theatres welcomes you to the exciting world of the movies. Smoking is not permitted in this auditorium. It's the law. Certificates are available at the box office. Thanks for helping us keep the theater clean. As you exit the auditorium, please deposit litter in trash receptacles in the lobby. Please be considerate and don't talk during the show. Magic has an exclusive holding ingredient, Flexinol. Sleep. Congesprin is more than aspirin because colds are more than a feverish feeling. Great way to fight Cold War symptoms and win. Congesprin. As the year began, a quarter million Americans faced the communists in South Vietnam. Swift movement and superior firepower blunted a series of communist offensives. Scores again. Pontiac GTO for 66, 6.5 liters. Fighting persisted all year in the central highlands around Pleiku. Americans suffered many casualties. Communist losses were four times as great. Hi, citizens. I'm Louis Nye, the cleanup man. I'm in no mood for remarks like business is picking up. <laughs> My business is too good. When will people give me and the landscape a break? Doesn't it make you fighting mad to see litter like this? It's an eyesore, a health hazard, a menace to navigation. And it costs tax dollars, too. Every litter bit hurts you. Carry a litter bag in boat and car. Keep America beautiful. The peasants suffered the ancient anguish of war. Death by violence. Meager possessions harrowed by bomb and flame. The struggle for the hearts of the people remains in doubt. If the president finds time to help the mentally retarded, what are you doing that's so important? Parking ticket for sleeping? <laughs> we gotta do something about this police brutality. <laughs> I need a smoke. <laughs> it's not how long you make them, it's how you make them long. <laughs> so, hey, Sue. You would have found yourself back on the streets at age nine. However, you would have learned that every cloud does indeed have its silver lining, for it was on the streets that you met someone who had a profound effect on the rest of your life. Hey, man, you want to buy some dope? Oh, that's Jerry the Honky! Harry the Junkie! Hey, hey, hey! The whole thing is a theatrical thing. We come from a background of, we worked in Second City, which is an improvisational theater school. I might say it's a school because yeah. it teaches you how to, to write on your feet. 
That fish was actually killed by pollution? Well, not directly, Tommy. You see, the fish crawled out of the water and was hit by a car. <laughs> if that water was clean, the fish never would have crawled out. I guess you think the water's cleaner in Russia? What does that have to do with it? I'm talking about poisoning ourselves. Well, I'd rather poison myself than live under a commie dictator. At Second City, they, they, they expect you to fail at about half the time. But the so. thing is, we, it, it taught us how to wear hats and glasses and to work with costumes and to be <laughs> uninhibited, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> really, it's a theatrical thing. Like, like you know, a Greek theater has the mask, you know? Well, the Blues Brothers have the shades and the sunglasses. And the soul like, patch. And the soul patch and the, and the, the suits. The, the suit, uh, that would the suit is important. It's a uniform. And, it, and without it, the act would, would be nothing. <laughs> Oh well, I had I'd quit Second City after a year at, in it, and I'd gone away to Europe to uh, just to loaf. And I remember getting a letter from uh, Joe Flaherty, who was in the company, saying that they'd hired a replacement for me, a, a little Albanian, and he's very funny. And I came back to Second City and rejoined the company, and uh, I had had a favorite spot on stage, which was upstage about 11 o'clock. <laughs> Uh, because upstage is a very strong spot to work from because you're behind the other actors and uh, we were t uh, doing an improv and I made a big entrance into the scene and I was heading for my, my favorite power spot on the stage and there was John just planted right there, you know, <laughs> he'd sort of, and wiggling his eyebrows in that crazy way at the audience and uh, I loved him. I mean, he had sort of usurped my position but it was okay because he was so funny and I, I remember he would get laughs, he would walk out on the stage and without saying a word, the first time the audience would see him, they would just start laughing. And it was the most wonderful thing. The underground is very much a fact of journalistic life. It has its own version of the Associated Press called Liberation News Service, and its own association for reprinting articles and offering advertising markets called the Underground Press Syndicate. It even has national conventions. Recently, its more prestigious papers were microfilmed by Bell and Howell, thus joining the New York Times in libraries across the country. So it is hardly underground. On the contrary, its papers are sold openly in the streets and on the newsstands. A more accurate description might be alternative, an alternative to the overground press. Paul Krasner, editor of The Realist, one of the oldest of these alternative publications. Well, underground is a misnomer. It's free. I mean, underground... Uh, would be something where you didn't know who was putting it out and you didn't know where to get more copies. But uh, the free press is just uh, something to fill the void left by the mass media. You know, it, uh, they just have a different attitude. At the time, there was no humor magazine for uh, adults. You could tell the difference between some kid if he read Boy's Life or Mad Magazine. They didn't want adult themes because it was essentially for teenagers. In 1958, Krasner self-launched The Realist, which quickly became the first counterculture publication in America. Meanwhile, Lenny Bruce was making his name as the first counterculture comedian. It was only a matter of time before the persecution of Lenny Bruce became a major One story. on the coast who's got like a nutty sense of humor, you know. His name is Paul Coates, and he found out, dig, like there were kids that eight and nine years old that were sniffing airplane glue. I'll tell you how the suit, the suit came about. I mean, the idea for the suit. The dark suit, the black suit. Well, line. I played this character called Shelley Bayless. Yeah. Played the most paranoid comic in the world. Yeah, I, I, you okay. know. Okay, now what happens with a lot of the paranoid comics and paranoid jazz musicians in the 50s were that there were a lot of them were shooting speed, you know? You know, like Lenny Bruce type mm -hmm. guys. And uh, so... Uh, they wore shades. No, they wore shades, but they wanted, they wanted to look inconspicuous. Cause they didn't want to and look straight. Fun. They wanted they to look, look straight. straight. So they wore suits. They wore suits. They wore black suits with black ties and white shirts. They made them look like insurance men, hoping that they wouldn't draw attention to themselves. Interesting. And they would, they'd wear the black hat, and they always wore sunglasses day and night, you know, <laughs> with these little soul patches on their lip. They, they so, blew their cover with it. So they it. thought, so instead of, so, be, so they draw attention, you know. It'd be 1 o'clock in the morning, they had these dark shades on. So it basically looks like a, a, a 50s hipster junkie. Though he did get arrested for, uh, ostensibly for obscenity, he knew, and the arresting officers knew, and the prosecutors knew, that it, uh, it was really because he was using political and religious figures as, as satirical targets. Catholicism is like Howard Johnson. And what they have are these franchises. After Lenny's death, Krasner began attacking sacred cows with a vengeance. 
He broke obscenity laws by circulating a poster designed to lure the establishment into supporting his own publicity stunt to illustrate the idiocy of America's obscenity laws. This is your paper, by the way, and uh, I don't have any gloves to wear, to, but I'll, I'll try to get some FISA hex right after the program and scrub good. What, the it issue says, or your hands? Uh, well, my hands, because it'll be from the issue that I'll need the, the scrubbing. Uh, which deodorant does Lyndon Johnson use? Now, what does that mean? <laughs> what is that? Well, I Paul Krasner, what is that? Which deodorant does Lyndon Johnson use? That's your front page head. <laughs> yes. Do you want to know which one? By brand name? No, I want to know what is that? What is the, what is the reason for that? Well, I think that the President of the United States uh, is at such a height uh, that people have such to... Such a what? A height. Height. He's put on such a pedestal that people have to realize that he is only a human being and does use a deodorant. <laughs> Like you and me. And I'm a little worried about you. I'm, I appreciate the fact... <laughs> no, but I, I do appreciate the fact that, it, that Krasner was kind enough after he said that to move away a few inches. We'd just come out of the 60s. We had the assassinations of Vietnam. Now we had Watergate. There was a lot of bad stuff going on. It's often the only magazine that a lot of younger hep people today read. And why that is, is I think they trust us. Uh, edu educational mind molding is diffused somewhat, largely because everyone takes a lot of dope. And uh, in one, a head issue we did, we did a number of games. It's called Delicatessen Roulette, where you go out for food and you ha come back and you have to eat the food directly above and below it on the shelf mixed in with it when you get it back. So you get combinations like peanut butter, um, mayonnaise, and bologna, which can be interesting. But th there's a better one called um, uh, Mr. Hoover, and you get yourself really wrecked, and then you uh, you're whistling back and you're very mellow, and then somebody uh, sort of goes in another room and goes, and knocks on the door, and everybody uh, crawls off the ceiling, and then you pretend the Jay Hoover just walked in the room, you have to play completely straight. And you, uh, uh, sort of go back to high school charm and say, Hey, Mr. Hoover, how are you? Gee, I haven't seen you in a long time. That'll be sorry. I missed you. If you just have a seat, I'd like to introduce you to some of my friends. That's Pam and Sue. Uh, Sue giggles a lot. Girls are really funny, you know. And uh, it, the idea is to keep straight for as long as possible. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, read a, a few uh, descriptions of typical high school characters uh, from the 60s and 50s based on that statement that Vonnegut made, which is the people who really pissed you off and really graveled your ass when you were in high school, are the same sort of personalities that uh, irritate you in adult life uh, on television. For example, everyone has had a, a character named uh, Carl Sazerowski, or Moose in his class, whose activities were varsity football, varsity basketball, varsity baseball, varsity track, varsity wrestling, varsity weightlifting, all-county football cup, McLoon Athletics Award, and remedial English club. Um, and the thing, the, uh, the sort of joycey and stream of consciousness character description goes like this. Spotlight on sports. Plowed, fuel-injected vet, want a knuckle sandwich, gross out, future marine, and hates homos. I'm a fraternity man. Um, you know, tap a keg of beer, I felt a thigh, eat a bite of pie, and signify nothing. We were taking on the idiocy of our own generation. It was like we had an attic full of culture from 1945 to 1970, and we just looted it. It is the job of a satirist to make people in power uncomfortable. Really uncomfortable. God damn, I don't believe it. Bob is out there. Bob, where are you? Bobby. Bob, where is he? I know he's out there, man. There he is, over there. Hey, Bob. Come on up here, Bob, and favor us with a tune. What do you say, Bobby? Come on up here. Come on, let's give him some encouragement. Let's get him up here. Come on, let's hear it. Come on, here he comes. Here he comes. Uh, uh, there he goes. One tune, Bob. Uh, He's not coming up. He's not coming up. Now I'll get him up here. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bobby. Hey, Bob. Hey. Come on up, Bob. We went from being criminals to heroes. What we didn't anticipate was that Hollywood would take away all of our creative talent. 
The Lampoon is the hippest place to be the right comedy. Until the hippest place to be the right comedy became Saturday Night Live. New York's Mayor Abraham Beam led a delegation of fellow mayors to Washington today seeking federal financial aid for New York. The costs and risks associated with any program to provide special federal financial assistance to prevent default substantially outweigh the benefits which prevention would provide. All I sense is that you have said that the administration will amend the Bankruptcy Act, number one. Number two, that you'll take care of the banks. In other words, don't worry about the folks in the cities, we'll take care of the banks. A mindless eating machine. It will attack and devour anything. It is as if God created the devil. A New York woman, when her needs are financial, her reaction is chemical. Chemical New York. Bill Murray was almost, he was like the eighth guy. That See, we all knew each other. Gilda and Billy and Brian, uh, his brother, and, uh, and I had all worked together up in Canada. And, and worked John had worked with, with Gilda and, uh, and Bill, Bill. <laughs> you know, and uh, like we all knew each other. And it was basically, I guess, Lauren just had to look around for other talent and then finally grab the people he knew were ripe and ready to do it, you know. And we went we, we went to school. We knew, we knew what we were doing. Well, I went into audition for Saturday night. I didn't want to go and audition with something that everybody knew. So all my friends, well, most of my friends were there auditioning. So there was a cattle call. You wouldn't believe there were hundreds. There were a lot of people who came in, but when I came and went in for mine, like 50 people came in the room to get me on the show. I mean, I had a lot of good friends who helped me. I walked in there, and they didn't know what I was going to do. And like they were hoping that I would show this producer who didn't like me. Lauren Michaels was not nuts about me. I had what you call a bad attitude. You know? <laughs> How about TV? And uh, so... Uh, I was kind of a punk, you know, I said, hey, you know, this is not very good, you know, but I'll do your show, you know, I was that kind of attitude, you know, I said, I'll let you, be, I'll let you have me on your show. I was real, <laughs> the worst way to try to get a job. <laughs> get super buys at Ward Super Sale. What kind of color TV can you get right now for just $499? Uh, beginning on October the 11th, Saturday night, we'll open up a whole new live venture from New York City, from Studio 8H here at Rockefeller Center. And we just happen to have the producer of the program, Mr. Lauren Michaels, with us, the producer of Saturday Night, and members of his company. And let's spend a couple of minutes talking about your show. Well, we've got eight, and we're hoping for two to really work. <laughs> so not all of these people will become stars. I mean, I, that's I what I said. That only two of you will be chosen Probably just to appear on the program. So the rest of yeah. you are just spinning your wheels. Is that what I mean? <laughs> Essentially, <laughs> yes. He had a, a great ability to physicalize, so he could make you laugh by raising his eyebrow, like Keaton or Chaplin, any of those people. And I would definitely compare him to those people uh, as a comedian. Oh. <laughs> What, not so good? Really bad? Well, how bad is my eyesight? <laughs> Okay. But we were the last two to get hired for we that show the because they weren't sure. We were. Too. We had reputations of, of uh, you know, questionable dependability and uh, violence and. Uh, what was your reputation? Uh, well, you know, I sort of uh, like to slip between the raindrops, as it were. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you bomb. I mean, yeah. it happens, and it's not slick. See, I think slickness is, is a big enemy of television. That's because to try to get it right, to do 50 takes. I like the fact that it's happening like that. It's I think the audience identifies with that. Excuse me, I'm talking. Under-rehearsed? <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> under-rehearsed because... Plus, when the writing's done so fast, you don't have some jerk producer. Uh, not Lauren Michaels, who's the best producer in television. Yeah, right. we, we write them so fast, it doesn't have a chance to get rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. And the original intention of the writer is... We just put on the show. It's not overthought, you know. Over it's not, a committee doesn't come in and say, "Oh, we can't say that." Oh, oh, I oh, think we should on. fudge. You, I tell ya, I just keep going. I just, I don't sleep. You never sleep, right? What do you live I, I haven't sleep. Hey, kid. No, listen, let's not get weird here. No, kid. I haven't slept for six years. Haven't slept for six years. Mm -hmm. Sounds pretty good. Yeah. Hey, uh, so you have no particular question or anything, huh? I, you ask me how I do it. You just yeah. gotta keep doing it. You don't even think about it. You, you worry about the present, and the future takes takes care of itself. Get it on, shoot! Come on, 
I would not do television left this was live. Like, yeah, there's no way. No, I mean, the slime prime time stuff is not for me or for us. We don't do that stuff. Live TV is exciting. There's a risk there. Take, you know? take mm -hmm. TV is there's not a exciting. risk. I mean, a live album is exciting to do. A live show is exciting to do, exciting to hear. That's why this album is exciting. I think there was just an attitude of rebellion and irreverence and uh, don't, don't trust the old order. Um, which was part of why the show could succeed. Yeah. Um, what we'd like to know is, is it really hard to get on to Saturday night? You mean on like, uh, on, on as an actor or as an actor, as a, as a person in the audience? Is it really hard to get on to Saturday night? No, let me just say yes. He said yeah. Okay. <laughs> We've been thinking about it here. Yeah? Well, yeah, really, we have. And uh, we're just wondering, because they never say anything at the end of the story, but no, if he just keeps hard. on doing what he's doing, he's yep. going to make so many people in the world so happy. Well, I hope so. I <laughs> hope so, because it sure isn't the money I'm after. <laughs> what? Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Bye. Hello. Every one of those Saturday nights has got, like, a, a real turkey or a couple of turkeys in it <laughs> and a couple of gems, you know? It's so we don't hit it. Tune in. You don't hit every like, sketch. You don't like hit every week. Yeah. You but uh, it's stuff. usually worth checking it out, flipping back to once in a while, you know? I tell you what, it takes about six shows to get our stride, you know? Like uh, into a new season. Yeah. You mean six every shows year, into a new season. Sure. Yeah. But every but year people one. say, every year people say, well, we didn't have it yet last year. Because you go from week to week, you know, you judge it from week to week. I used to get real depressed. I think, oh, God. Who we got on the show this week? This turkey, and we do it best. The writing's weak, and we go and do it, and it's a terrible show. And everybody wants to kill themselves after the show. Everybody wants to. And then people run up and say. And then the next week, yeah, every people say, "Hey, that was great." Was good. And the next week, we'd have a show, and it'd be great. And we all say, "Oh, we have a great show." You can't tell. You we just, just do going. the best we can, you know. We in the live going. situation, that's all we you can know, do. You know, the we critics just... can say whatever they want. I don't yeah. really. You know, care. at this point, at this point, they're gonna have to hose us out of the building to make us leave. I don't they're gonna care. have to throw me right off the job because I can. I want to show. Say they say leave the show. Do this. Why should I leave the show when I find like doing the show? It's hard. Is it still but you don't fun? leave something because it's, it's still fun after. Sure, it's sure. On on air, once it gets on the air, once you're on live, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's fun while I'm on. You know, it could be no matter how mad I get during the week, or crazy, or when I quit. When that show goes on live, I'm smiling the whole time. Hi, Mark. Uh, John, I just have a question for you. I understand that uh, this year is the last year for Saturday Night Live. What? And uh, Lauren Michaels supposedly is going to be executive producer of another show next year with uh, Gene Demania. Is that true? I don't really know, man. <laughs> it's news to me. Where did, okay. Where Gene Demania? Where did you hear this stuff? Well, I heard this from someone in New York who you know uh, works out of NBC. Well, John, I don't... Uh, well, it's a shock to me. I might, <laughs> I might quit the show then. Are you guys... Going back to Saturday night, no. ever? Saturday night does not exist anymore. Well, no, no, no. no. As we know it. Well, as we know it. As, as, we, as we knew we it. it. You know? That's it. not... It, it, Gene Demanion is uh, the it, new There's producer. a new staff, a new writers, a new producer, and, and there should be on. all fresh people. See, what John and I, we explored everything we could. You know, it got to the point where he was doing Samurai just once too often, and I was, you know, another Conan, I, so here I, we go again. That, you know? it was, if it was up to NBC, I, I, I'd have done it every week. Yeah. Chris, there was kids, Levi's. Ornery little critters. Seems like nothing stops them. Billy says he's on an island where there's no McDonald's filet of fish sandwiches. This flash unit's been going all night. And it's going to keep on going. The seven natural fruits, luscious luau fruits. Come on and go, Hawaii. New country blends, chow, chow, chow. Now my cat and I have something new to chow 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 about Friday. A hard-headed Shirley takes on a hard-headed boss, and Bill falls in love with a rock singer. No, I don't easy to do it radio. I used to do sleazy late night TV. It's uh, hey, uh, movies and stuff. How, how, how do you how do you get away with it? We say caca, we say poo poo. You know, we say penis. Sir, pe we can say penis. Okay. I heard tits the other night. No, I got in big trouble once for saying uh, that word here. You know. I don't know. How you, I mean, how do you do it? Uh, we um, we're on late night. Right. We're on late at night. And really, it's not so bad because uh, Carson gets away with worse 
Yeah, Definitely. but he has, he's has he been there a lot longer. But he pays so, our salary, right? right? <laughs> so, okay. Uh, <laughs> he needs no sets, and he sits there with a the band and uh, sits down and has no script, no writers. Big hit of scotch. Really? Took it right yeah. back. Yeah, Took it right sure. down, just right. before going out, you know? So if whatever works for people, if you're creative people, if it's coming to you in the dream, whatever it is, as long as it's not necessarily ruining your life, right? I think we all know talk show hosts that touch their nose a little too often. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no. little, what do you think that means? Of, Beats me. Or do one of these. <laughs> yeah. What else is there? New Purina, moist and chunky. Purina, moist and chunky. But in a meat locker, my meat's worth a fortune these days. It's great for a family of four. Or five. Or five. Five. Fairmont, America's proven success. Happy Endings, brought to you by Jell-O Brand Gelatin. What's the relationship between uh, Saturday Night Live and the N and NBC and the, the standards of practices? Is that what they call them? We have uh, a, a, an understanding woman <laughs> and an understanding man who alternate the duty uh, on the on the uh, board at Saturday night. Now, they sit there and uh, the writers will put in stuff in the script and generally they're very reasonable, you know? They seem to be. And they sit there and uh, the writer, we explain, uh, you know, the context in which something is written and if they disagree with it and think that uh, you know certain words like bulges or head cream or blow master I mean I, I've mentioned I've mentioned hair products here you know yeah. really uh, they're, they're pretty understanding you know uh, it's gone as high as the president of NBC who's had to hand down a, a verdict because Lauren takes it that high he really fights See, for it if you don't it. fight for it you're not gonna get it won't get it on the air you won't yeah. get it on the air so if you just sit there like a lot of shows do and say oh well it's the censors well you gotta go to the censors you gotta show them you gotta explain it to them you gotta argue your point you know and you fight all the way down the line they don't just give up. Faber College, 1962. The brothers of Delta House have a problem. The dean wants them expelled, the other frat houses want their charter revoked, and the mayor wants them dead. How did this happen? Well, it had something to do with the stolen exam, the toga party, the food fight, the dean's wife, the mayor's daughter, and the dead horse. But then in 1962, they just didn't understand the concept of independent study. National Lampoon's Animal House, starring John Belushi, rated R. Now playing in a theater near you. I heard from Peter Wolf you, you made a lot of money on Animal House. Is that... Yeah, I got uh, two devil dogs and a free ticket to the Wiz to Animal House. <laughs> Great. Did anybody expect that Animal House would be as successful as I it did. was? I you did. did. I sure did. When yeah. we were filming it, we, I thought it was really marvelous. I recognized in this treatment a ton of stuff that was, I thought was really funny and really taking some chances with, with humor, with the culture, with the issue of rebellion. Animal House was a misunderstood uh, animal, if you will, uh, throughout its entire history at Universal. But uh, Ned had a gleeful love for the project. He also hated it. Sat down with John and his take on it, what he, how he saw it and what he thought it should be was in fact exactly what it would be at its, in its best form. There's, there's dialogue humor and sort of drawing room humor and bedroom humor, and the, the level of sophistication of the gags rise and fall. And it's a very traditional movie, I think. It has a very traditional story, p people being bullied and then striking back. And they're very kind of the outrageous group. I just grew up at a time when uh, traditional heroes were crumbling and uh, they were replaced by the, by the rebels. I think Americans particularly have a great love for rebels. The country was started by rebels and uh, uh, the Marx Brothers were great symbols of uh, anarchy and anti-establishment behavior. And Americans love an underdog and they, they love the person who swims against the stream, the nonconformist. And I think that shows in our work. And especially what we choose institutions, uh, or we Animal House, uh, and with college and here with the army, uh, uh, these are traditional uh, enemies of free thought, in a way. Uh, I think it's really a mainstream American comedy. I don't find it uh, radical at all. And as far as being subversive, I don't think we lead our audience so much as uh, echo what they already feel. Right. As I recall, it was always the intention that John would be the, the star, that this was a vehicle for him. And that, and that he would represent Lampoon in a certain way. Faith. Real faith. A man's a true fan. True friend. But wait a minute. What's he doing? He's pulling out 
A gun. It was John Belushi's first movie. He was paid a modest $35,000 to make it. I have no co-star in this movie. It's a star, and then there's the others. I'm working with a bunch of medium talent. On that show, every writer, if he chooses to, can produce his own piece. Right. Go out there, and, and that's what Lorne Michaels has done. He's he's given everybody, he's saying, listen, these are the facilities you can learn how to produce if you want. That's what we did with the Blues Brothers. I mean, we said we got the contract to do it. Said it was, we would do just what we want to do. We do what we want to do. You know, like if anybody suggested, well, we want to do this song, this song. We I'd listen to everybody. You know, we listen to who to get for the group, what group to get, mm -hmm. and say yes, yes, and then go and do what we wanted to on our own. You can't be forced to say like you have to make a single. We had a we, meeting. You know, at either that. we've got the goods mm -hmm. or we don't mm -hmm. have the goods. You do what you do. You can't try something. That, that... Jake and Elwood had always been searching for something. They didn't know what it was, but one day they found it. The blues. I got the blues! Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi, the Blues Brothers, on Atlantic Records and Tapes. Available at this fine store. Now you guys are going to make a movie together. Uh, which one? Do you mean 41? 1941. Yeah, that's Even Spielberg's new movie. This is just <laughs> now it's getting... It's an acting gig. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, right. Well, but, there might be a little uh, help in rewriting. I get you know? to play. The, the nice thing about this, I get to play a P-40 pilot. You know, the, the, the World War II planes are like that. Uh, and uh, <laughs> well, as far as I'm concerned, any movie that lets me get up on top of an M3 tank and uh, fire a 50 caliber machine gun, I'm going any to go movie and lets do me it. Fly a fighter plane and uh, straight Hollywood uh, Boulevard. That's, that's I'm right. I'm going to do it. That's and right. And crash in the Grumman's Chinese Theater. I'm going to do we, it. I don't uh, care about dialogue one bit. No, sir. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Stephen wanted to do a comedy because he was inspired by, of all things, Animal House. Uh, John's movie, which was a big success. Animal House just, uh, that's a, you know, that, that put him on the map as far as uh, even bigger than Saturday Night Live. So it was a great comedy, and, uh, and Spielberg wanted to do something like that. But he didn't quite have that uh, knack. Good at drama, very good at drama. Comedy, not, he was lost. We wrote a lot of stuff for the movie. We wrote a lot of scenes for the picture that didn't get in, some of them. Uh, there just wasn't enough time. There was eight stories. I think there was just too many stories. That might have been the problem. Yeah, I think that it was just, uh, the plot was too involved. It, was, uh, it should have been a little simpler. He was always asking us for advice. I felt weird, you know. Stephen would he'd say, what do you think of this scene? I thought, this is Steven Spielberg asking me what I think of that scene. So, you know, I'd tell him, but, uh, so it didn't come together very well. They'd love to have uh, me do uh, Animal House Goes to Camp, Animal House Joins the Army, Animal House uh, Rides a Space Shuttle, you know, but uh, it's not the way I work. You know? Hear me, Stanley. Charlie's main worry in the past, and it's a commendable thing in itself. He wants to make better pictures. I meant what I said. I'm not bargaining with you, Stanley. You're standing up the bargaining position! But it's true, I can't force you to sign, can I? That's just what you're trying to do! Charlie, stand Shut up, that! Oh, Charles. Charles. I'm going to have to take this very much amiss. Darling, there'll always be Stanley Hobbs in this world. Not just in the movie industry, but everywhere. Always one who, just by his contempt for decency and human dignity, tries to drag down the rest. Charlie, no. And Hoff's prisoner angel in signing this contract is the ransom fee. I didn't have the nerve that night. I made the wrong decision. We made the wrong decision that night in this room. I should have swung the other way. Boy, you must be a busy guy. You do Saturday Night Live. You yeah. have time for movies. You have time for the Blues Brothers projects. Yeah. 
Now, now you guys really went out on tour Plus on that, I'm, didn't a, I'm a night manager at Burger King. Of, <laughs> <laughs> well, hold the pickle, John. In New John. York. I have to keep working. And I'm like a shark. If I stop, I'll die. You know? Yeah, I, I, I sense that. So, I mean... I don't know why I do it. Well, but you're I, good at it, man. You're so good at it. I'd, right. you, I'd fly out on, on Sunday to Eugene, Oregon. I'd have to go to San Francisco to Eugene. On Wednesday, I go from Eugene to San Francisco, back to Saturday night, go back, boom, bang. I'd go to Durango to do that... Don't be baited to go see going south because I'm not in it much. That's oh, all I got. To is say it still about out? Is it still out in the theaters? Or, uh, no, it's oh, okay. I'm not sure. Anyway, well, you were uh, don't don't belittle yourself. I never you saw the real movie. cute one. He had a gold tooth in his mouth. He I just don't nice want people to be baited and think that I'm in a lot of movies. He looked great. He looked great. He did a decent job. He did his job, and uh, there's you know. a little bit of an exploitation on their part. They did that because they really. Uh, well, Hollywood is filled with a lot of slime, and I'm not going to mention any names. You know, you should play on this, awesome. uh, on this show. Uh, you should They've got play. ice water going through their veins. Let's face it. More of the alcohol. Matt, you got to get me out of this. Darling, I'm terribly worried. Everybody has got the delusion that you're very tough. They mix you up with the parts you play. But I know you better. You're a special idealistic type. The only thing business and idealism they don't mix it's oil and water a movie is is not a movie to you is it? it's a gospel but you are mistaken dear sir and friend in all humility Dad, shut up in all please humility. shut up people who control the money in hollywood says this guy has a certain uh popularity and so forth we will run the risk because we think that uh, we know how to control him and uh, we'll end up making money. Because that's the name of the game. It's called show business. Off the wall, Belushi is about the last person you'd think of for a romantic leading man, but he wanted to do it. I, I liked it, but I wasn't concerned about losing any fans. I mean, I might lose a few people who do angel dust, stuff like that. That crowd might be gone. <laughs> I hope to get it back with the next picture. <laughs> Belushi dropped about 40 pounds for this part, but mountain climbing still did not come easy. Last night I saw Rex review a movie with my friends, in it, Dan and John. They're very funny guys. They work very hard. And uh, Rex's review was something to the effect of, that fat slob, John Belushi played a fat slob. This guy's a, a dip. I don't like him. And he can sue me. I don't, what, I, what I'm trying to say is, Tom, you're, you don't do that to people. In fact, you were nice enough to Rex to laugh at his reviews. People up there laugh, too. I'm not sure what they're laughing at. Uh, and if he thinks he's la they're laughing at Myra Mar Breckowitz or his great performances or what. But when people do things like, say things that nasty about movies, I don't want to see him on the air. And I'm glad this shows up if, if he's gone. <laughs> he's, uh, he's Those going. are my friends, and I don't like that, what he said. Well, Why don't you just review a movie and say... Wasn't that instead of you know, doing a whole now, act? Now, now can I have a little equal time? Please? Don't you think there's a growing trend today in the media, those who write about what we do, whether it's motion pictures or television, to be vicious? I know for a fact that there is a columnist who works for one of the major newspapers here in New York who has been told by his editors, you must be more vicious. We want more uh, vicious attacks upon who people who perform. Who? Who? <laughs> no, don't. No, I'm don't not going to do it. No. Uh, yeah, I think that any... Form they of, praised, any form of journalism they is yellow journalism they, anyway. They it's capitalistic. You have to make a buck. Yeah, but they praised you on Saturday Night Live, and they couldn't wait to knock your movies. And then I'm That's sure you correct. start thinking, hey, maybe I'm not really any good. Look at what they're writing about me. Ben, Ben, what, what should I do? I, I seem to be at the end of my rope. Yeah, I know what you mean, man. Hey, mind if I have some of your booze? Ghost is a slob. Ben, can, can you give me some advice? Look, man, I told you to go west years ago, but no! Yes. You're writing it? I'm writing it as we speak. Uh, Sweet Home Chicago. Is this the script for it? Uh, this, uh, this, might well, be this is kind of a basis in it. Uh, well. We just want to get everybody who's out there. We want to get Luther Allison. Uh, you know, we want to we get wanna make uh, the movie, you know, Sun Seals, man. We want to get... The uh, guys who are still around. Uh, uh, with the, what happened? Well, you know, we could go on and on. You better get bright, pal. We got a show to do. Then we got to figure out some way to collect that gate money. Get it to the Cook County Assessor's office as soon as they open in the morning. 
Joliet, Jake, and Elwood Blues. Two men with a mission, and only 11 days. Two guys come in here, black suits, black hats, one carrying a briefcase? Yeah, I just sent them down there. Thank you. John Belushi. You, how much for your wife? Lots of space in this mall. That money's got to be in the Cook County Assessor's office within 11 days. They wouldn't turn you out, would they? Shit. What's one more old nigga to the Board of Education? Curtis, you and the Penguin are the only family we got. You're the only one that was ever good to us. Singing Elmore James tunes and blowing the harp first down here. Well, the sister was right. You boys could use a little churching up. Slide on down to the Triple Rock and catch Reverend Cleophas. You boys listen to what he's got to say. Curtis? I don't want to listen to no jive-ass preacher talking to me about heaven and hell. Jake, you get wise. You get the church. The the last place maybe some folks saw you was in the the motion the Blues Brothers movie. The Blues Brothers. Yeah. yeah. What was that like for a, a musician to be in a film? Well, um, as a minister, it was kind of what I was doing all alone. Uh -huh. I've been like preaching one way or another to humanity, you know, taking uh, getting in on the issues I probably should have gotten in on, but uh, I I think that everybody should be counted sometime, and I did that. But uh, working with the Blues Brothers was a fantastic experience. John Belucci, big round of applause. But these fellows, they spent their own personal money and proved themselves. And uh, it proved something. It also proved something to the movie industry and the film industry that the entertainers have always been actors. They never had the shot. Yeah. And thank God we have people like that around and young people like that that are enhancing our whole business. Part of the joke of the first Blues Brothers is size. I mean, everything's gigantic. I mean, it's, everything's exaggerated to such a huge extent. So it was interesting. People were going, well, car crash, song. Gee, that doesn't compute. I just couldn't describe events without getting in trouble and without people looking at me like, what have you got us into? Yeah, well, we did run over, but the footage is going to be excellent. I tell you, it's movie history. <laughs> It'll all be on the screen, I promise. Okay, I'll see you in LA. Now, obviously, you couldn't, uh, one couldn't duplicate the first movie. It would cost too much. I mean, it cost $27 million then. What do you think the cost was of your second special, Mario? Twenty-seven million hundred million thousand dollars. And for all those millions of dollars, what do you think it brought us in terms of rating? Perhaps things are looking up. Honey... You owe us one more question. I see Burt Reynolds on a battleship with a hundred dancing girls. Behind him, the Roman army. No Burt Reynolds, no battleships, no dancing girls, no Roman army descending, sweetheart. You're going to make this special for us, and you're going to make it for the sum of $1,200. I can make no special for $1,200. You can't, huh? Well, let me tell you something, Angel Pants. You better, or else we're going to come and we're going to take your mansion, your yacht, your Rolls Royce, and your fancy clothes, okay? You better. In 1919, Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, and D.W. Griffith, perhaps four of the most famous people on Earth, formed their own studio, United Artists. Hollywood had seen nothing like it before. A movie company to be run by the talent. For the next 60 years, 
United Artists made such classics as Some Like It Hot, Midnight Cowboy, Last Tango in Paris, One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest, Annie Hall, Rocky, Raging Bull, and all of the James Bond pictures. But in the winter of 1979, two young executives, desperate for a picture that would propel them to the Academy Awards, decided to make a film that destroyed the company. Motion pictures are potentially the most influential form of communication ever invented. And there's no control over them. Your message reaches everyone, everywhere. Message? Of course. Mr. Chaplin here reaches millions who only have to see. And when they see a mockery being made of our immigration services, I'd call that a message. Yes, well, as you've already said, Mr. Hoover, motion pictures are for the people. Most of the people work for a living and they don't make much money doing it. It gives them pleasure to see official them and the upper classes giving a kick up the backside. Always has, and it always will. I think Heron's Gate was used by powers that be to stop a way of filmmaking where the author was the director and was in control of the money. What Michael Cimino wanted to make was the Johnson County War a film about the West as it was. Not cowboys and Indians, but homesteaders fighting to lay claim to a better life. At the turn of the last century, great waves of European immigrants, Germans, Slavs, encroached on the grazing land of ranchers. In Johnson County, Wyoming, this conflict turned violent when the ranchers hired mercenaries to kill those immigrants it suspected of stealing cattle. What distinguished Chimino's script was its claim that these murders were sanctioned by the governor of Wyoming, the U.S. Congress, and the President of the United States. Now, if you're going to stay cool, you've got to wail. You've got to put something down. You've got to make some jive. Don't you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Well, that's all I'm saying. My father was going to take me on a fishing trip to Canada once. Yeah. We didn't go. Crazy. You've been listening to white people for 400 years. They said they were going to do something. They haven't done a thing, as far as I'm concerned, in re-enfranchising the black man. When such an order as this moves in and takes over the police power, you are all completely at their mercy and their atrocities and their violence can be vested on anybody that disagrees with them in any given situation. What started as a joke a hundred years ago when a group of men donned bedsheets for a romp has over the years attracted to it persons charged with acts of harassment, intimidation, and violence throughout the South. Even though the nation has been outraged for many years, the Ku Klux Klan persists with its bizarre ritual and trappings. That could have been my son lying there. And I'm going to do as much as I can. The Reverend said, the white man can't cool it because he's never dug it. And I'm here to try to dig it. That you have to think uh, about your ratings when you're giving the show, when you're doing the show. And you have to make the show as interesting as possible. And to the question of whether or not I throw manure out of, uh, what was it? Uh, <laughs> fourth story window of a house on 52nd oh, yeah. Street. I mean, that's, that's a part of the sea of dullness. Yeah. I just wish I could get you to understand. What is there to understand? You trade lives and human dignity for profit. Money, not morality, is the principal commerce of civilized nations. Thomas Jefferson, 200 years ago. That is the philosophy that built this nation. You know about this nation. Don't you ever give a second thought to American citizens? You're the reason their money's worthless. You're the reason old people are eating out of garbage cans, and kids get killed in bullshit wars. You're not in the oil business, you're in the oil shortage business. You're an ivory tower hoodlum. Hey, Johnny, what are you rebelling against? What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> the 
Club Shalimar is proud to present a young man who will tickle your funny bone from Morton, Ohio. Jojo Dancer. Hey, quit it, yeah. Don't be in show business. I don't want to clean up hog goods the rest of my life. My impression of the first man on the sun. I know you can make it, Jojo. Jojo. With his booze, bras, and blow, huh? Yeah! No! You're going to NBC. You're going to do your own special. <laughs> and man in his blackness did walk the earth, making up medicine. Medicine? Then discovered type. These were all black people got down. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. This ain't, there ain't nothing in here about Whitey. This is ours, Jack. Wait till the brothers hear this. Get the bulldozers, there's nothing here. But, 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 but. Shut up! And uh, of course, uh, we were wiped out systematically. There were uh, FBI documents that falsified uh, bank records. The uh, Black Panthers any scared time, people. Anytime the black man attempts to change the slave image, he will scare white people. I just think it's part of capitalism is to promote racism, you know, right? In order to uh, make things work, if you feel better because you're white and you can get a job, uh, you use that. I mean, you know, I would. Absolutely. Uh, and that separates people. So they keep people separated, and that keeps them from thinking about the real problem. That's, that's as simple as I see it. Probably is not that simple, but... Today, Charles Gary insists Newton was a victim, not a villain. The FBI killed him. When I say killed him, I don't mean they put a gun over his head. They destroyed him as a person where he became a paranoid, sick person. MK Ultra is a CIA program started nearly 25 years ago to control human behavior through the use of drugs, electric shock, psychosurgery, and other rather sophisticated techniques. I used to have nightmares I'd be asleep, and people would take me in another room and operate on my brain. <laughs> and then put, put me back in the other room when I wake up. I got to steal money from myself. I got to go to the Bahamas and steal my own self money that I pay taxes on. I ain't tricking nobody but me. I In a not-too-distant suburb, on a very quiet street. Well, I guess it's about that time. You need help? Earl Keese, a reserved, hard-working homeowner, sits calmly waiting for his dinner. Little does he know he's about to meet the neighbors. But we've discovered that owning things and consuming things does not satisfy our longing for meaning. What do you say, neighbor? Welcome to the end of the road, I guess. Great house. And the producer of the film heard that there was a punk rock band going to play that music. He said, no, there's no way that's going to happen. John immediately started picking up typewriters, kicking televisions, jumping up on the secretary's desk and breaking the lamps. And my phone machine was lit up like a Christmas tree when I got home. He said, man, did you hear what John did today? What was once an expression of working class rage is now prepackaged individuality for teens with a yen for rebellion. Punk may well be dead in London and New York, but it's alive and well in suburbia. Ron Jr., 15, was a junior high school football star. Rhonda, 16, was a cheerleader. Now, the kids are punks. And for the Hodges, that's a big problem. They were thinking of putting me in a mental hospital for a while. When Cowboy Ronnie comes to town Works out his tongue at human rights Sick 
found and joy I am in here. Guy and some charred royal blood. Hi, I'm Frank Sinatra. I hope you'll join me on January 20th to celebrate the inauguration of the 40th president of our blessed country. There are many handsome inaugural souvenirs that I'm stocking up on. You may want some for your children and their children. Selling these souvenirs pays for the inaugural event. And here's Big Ed to tell you all about it. That book uh, title in itself could be inflammatory, could it not? I mean, yeah, that's going to lead a lot of people to think that uh, somehow Ronald Reagan is connected with the mob, with organized crime? Well, basically the book is about uh, MCA, the most powerful entertainment conglomerate in the world. They own Universal Pictures, Universal Television, MCA Records. It's about Reagan, the most powerful man in America. And it's about the Chicago Mafia, the most powerful organized crime group in the country. The major characters being Reagan, uh, Lou Wasserman, the most powerful man in the entertainment uh, world. Uh, he's chairman of the board of MCA, and he was Reagan's talent agent when he was in Hollywood. And it's about Sidney Korshak, the Chicago Mafia's link between uh, the, uh, to, the, to the Hollywood film industry, and he's been described by law enforcement officials as the liaison between the legitimate business world and organized crime. What basically what I'm charging is that MCA, throughout its, um, uh, has, has invented, uh, created Ronald Reagan. 90 miles. It's nothing. It's one small step looking for a man that wants to be president of the United States having the cash to make it possible. Michael, we're bigger than U.S. steel. How Hitler got started, we take you to Bremerhaven, 1927, the largest theatrical office in Germany. M.C.A. Mein Kampf arises. Don't bother me, hey, what is it? Don't look now. I think the guy on your right that's painting the wall. You two guys are coming to Dallas, and so I'll see you when you come to perform as the Blues Brothers right. in person. Okay. Okay. Dallas, see that, uh, Thank you very much. Our president. What? <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Thank you. It's designed to uh, bring attention to the end of the American dream and the beginning of the me generation. The, uh, the thing that got the ball rolling was the Kennedy killings. The main causes were Vietnam and Watergate, where people decided they didn't care anymore, not their effort didn't matter, all they cared about is themselves. And uh, there was a settlement between MCA and the federal government with the Kennedy Justice Department in 1962. And as a proviso of this settlement, all criminal and civil charges against the, the uh, MCA and its indicted co-conspirator, the Screen Actors Guild, particularly the Screen Actors Guild while Reagan was president, uh, that all criminal and civil charges against and investigations of these people would be dropped, which included Ronald Reagan. So they were going to set up Marilyn Monroe with Bobby and John one more time, because they all love Buckner, and they were going to film it like they did with Jay Ruhoover. They had Jay Ruhoover in their pocket for years, because yeah. he was a cross-dresser. Course, yeah. We are not machines, no matter how much they want to say we are, we are not. And what is what are you without Hot Federator behind you? I built the studio. I, I, with my brain and my hand, I ripped it out of the world. And we face him, let's get Bobby, because he's the one busting balls. Let's get Bobby. Bobby and her have an, uh, uh, a conversation, unbeknownst to everybody. He says, fuck you, I'm going, your brother, you, and I'm going to. Two days later, she was dead. Two days later, no overdose. She died of oxygen. They kept pumping oxygen to her for a long until she, that's it, had an aneurysm. And he's still sort of in the pocket of MCA and some of the people he held back then, and vice versa. Now, I'm saying that he was, an, he was an invention of MCA. I'm further saying that MCA has dealt with organized crime throughout its history. Another John F. Kennedy quote uh, that's a little closer to our hearts is he makes peaceful revolution impossible, makes violent revolution inevitable. Governments are a drug just as religion is, just as television is. It's just to placate people. Uh, there's no such thing as communism or capitalism. They just invented those two terms to have each other scared of each other so they can control us. So there's no such thing as politics. And uh, you change faces, you change the name, but it's all the same run by the three or four different people who control everything, and you never know who they are. So it's politics usually big are useless. Money. It's just big money all the time behind it. Politics are useless. They're just something to uh, <coughs> uh, take your mind off of what's really going on. It's a smoke screen. Has it ever occurred to you, Wally, that the process that creates this boredom that we see in the world now may very well be a self-perpetuating, unconscious form of brainwashing created by a world totalitarian government based on money? And that all of this is much more dangerous than one thinks? And it's not just a question of individual survival, Wally, but that somebody who's bored is asleep and 
somebody who's asleep will not say no? I don't know where the money is, but if you need money, I'll give you money. But this, this really surprises me. I'm really shocked. Because I thought we had something here a lot stronger than just business. <laughs> I mean, you know, I love you more than I love my own family. I do. I want to protect you. I want to help you. I want to protect you from the outside world. Protect you, protect you from people like me, you know. And I think I'm doing a good job. A working class hero is something to be. A working class hero is something to be. But the system is so geared that everybody believes that just the father will fix everything. The father being the government. Government will fix everything. It is all government's fault. You know, bad, shake your fist at the government. Well, we are the government. So I think we're being run by maniacs for maniacal mean uh, ends, you know. They're after, they're after us because we we talk Absolutely. about peace, you know. I mean, peace, you know, we've said the same thing for two years, different way, one way or another. Keep your dope with the religion and sex and TV. You'd think you're so clever and classless and free. Well, you still think our peasants as far as I can see. Don't be afraid. I can't hurt you through the television. But imagine if you woke up one night and found someone who looked like me in your home. You'd be scared. You don't have to be afraid anymore. Is it a little dangerous to rely on each other? Uh, well, it is if one of us gets snuffed. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I think uh, we're going to both try to stay alive and, and work together. Yeah, I mean, we don't think in terms of what it's going to do to our careers. You know, I mean, it, it just, uh, it, we have fun working together. We're in that we want to provide good entertainment value for your dollar. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the New Wave Theater. It was a custom in ancient Greece to pass a skeleton around the table before every banquet to remind everyone of their mortality. Today, in Regan country, it's only at funerals and times of loss that we allow ourselves to see the transience of life, for no one wants to be reminded of the passage of time. The suspect in today's shooting is a 25-year-old white man from Evergreen, Colorado, John W. Hinckley, son of an executive of the Vanderbilt Oil Company based in Colorado, his family is described as arch-conservative Republican. And tonight, the head of the Nazi party in the United States says Hinckley was expelled from the group because he, quote, liked to shoot people and blow things up. Like I said, I won't hurt you. I'm an actor. But there are people out there who aren't acting. Call me. President Bush and Defense Secretary Weinberger are members of other camps. Richard Nixon is a bohemian, and so are high-ranking executives of such companies as Eastern Airlines, Standard Oil of Indiana, and Bank of America. For the most part, the men of Bohemian Grove are over 50, highly successful, and according to many employees, politically conservative. Well, each year, uh, many of them seem to have a stunt, uh, or try to come up with a stunt. Last year, 1980, uh, the popular button was uh, Free the Fortune 500. Other regular activities include the production of two plays, one of which involves major sets, orchestral music, and extravagant costumes. The other play appears to be just a bit on the lighter side, at least judging from these old photos. Members also... Now see how easy it is for you to own a piano or organ. Who would have thought we could afford a piano of our own? Do you have a good idea? How much is it worth? Well, it's certain you won't find out until you do something about it. Curtis Blow learned how to rap on the streets. He learned how to construct his raps and how to control his crowds as a college student. I learned it in speech. Uh, the greatest orators of all time use crowd response. Somebody scream! 10,000 or more had come to receive the blessing of Pope John Paul. Instead, amongst the cheering and the peal of bells announcing the arrival of the Pope, they heard gunfire and saw the Pope turn pale and collapse, bloody, into the arms of his aides. Pope John Paul II had been shot. A Turkish terrorist 
who had threatened... Film, maybe you'll become a big movie star like Benji. My uh, agent and myself are finding it very hard to convince other people in the show business community to hire me for other television shows. <laughs> are you, and you're laughing at this. I think that you're laughing at it is pretty tasteless. Reviewing Stan in a low fly pass when suddenly a grenade was thrown and shots fired from anti-tank units moving directly in front of President Saddam. Thinking it was all part of the military display, it took seconds to realize the bullets were for real. A spray of bullets aimed directly at the Egyptian president, vice president, defense minister, and their entourage. President Reagan is telling visitors that Sadat's death makes it more imperative than ever to sell those AWACS radar planes to Saudi Arabia. Now how much would you pay? Well, you also get this giant four-quart Royal Durasteel colander. It holds pounds of pasta, piles of potatoes. I developed a taste for things like burritos and sugary soft drinks. I tried all the fad diets and an exercise salon, but they only worked for a while. Chick helped me overcome those junk food cravings and helped retrain my eating habits. Now I'm in control. How many diets will you try? Mother, you must always obey my voice. Do you hear? You can relax. Do you see the flame? I think that New York is the new model for the new concentration camp, where the camp has been built by the inmates themselves, and the inmates are the guards, and they have this pride in this thing they've built. They've built their own prison, and so they exist in a state of schizophrenia, where they are both guards and prisoners, and as a result, they no longer have, having been lobotomized, the capacity to leave the prison they've made, or to even see it as a prison. And then he went into his pocket, and he took out a seed for a tree, and he said, this is a pine tree. He put it in my hand and he said, escape before it's too late. Mr. Suchak, there's nothing personal in this. I'm sure that you're a fine newspaper man. But I do serious work here, in private and in peace. I'm not a pop singer. I don't have a million records to sell. Publicity is trite and trivial. Reporters are parasites. They feed off the accomplishments of other people. I don't see newspapers much, but what I do see sickens me. Well, they only cost 20 cents. Can I ask you a question? What's a nice girl like me doing in a place like this? No comment. Make that godforsaken place like this. Godforsaken? Come on. Where are we going? Church. Pardon? Church. Oh. The oldest one in America. of it used to be like. What did, what did it feel like when it started? Well, it felt like a lot of dirty rooms back like this, back in the kitchen. And you're all huddled around feeling nervous. Essentially, yeah. that's it, you know. Uh, TV, back to the TV studio, as you well know, looks sort of like a garage. You know, there's a very little mystique to it. And it's all high energy and people are wound up very tight. You know, that works. Beam up, Scotty. No sign of intelligent life down here. Once again, there were never drug dealers that wanted you to hang out at their place you know you, the whole idea was to get in and get out fast right. in this case the idea was to come in and much like a speakeasy or the algonquin club the idea was to put it on the table share it with everyone else hang out pick up a guitar go to the piano uh see who shows up next so what more is there to say about the town i was born in and live in just that from tomorrow I'm moving out. It's too full of predators and opportunists who are living this real life in a false way. To a place where there's more to ritual than 
Snorting cocaine and phoning your agent. They saw him as a as a star that could put people in the seats, and there was a project that was hanging around the studio that wanted to get made. They had an option on it. They paid money to get it written, and they saw John as the expressway to uh, to uh, to get it done. You have to read it. You're not going to believe it. And, you know, they, and they said they want me to wear a diaper in this movie. That's how it's going to open. Like I'm a baby in a diaper. Oh, don't do that piece of shit. Are you kidding me? Come on. Get away. Get away. Get out. Get away. Come home. It's the spring. Things will happen over the summer or the fall. We'll figure something out. I was writing Ghostbusters right then. Which it was n <clears throat> never my intention to try to reach an audience or to, uh, to have a big audience or, or, or to even be in films. I just wanted to, you know, do shows off Broadway and things like that. John Hi, I'm Michael Dare, and this is The Bottom Shelf. This is where tapes end up, because they simply don't belong anywhere else. I mean, where do you file beyond the valley of the ultra vixens, anyway? I have the deformity of some enormity. They call me the elephant man. I used to do a thing about that, too, about called celebrity about this man signing on to guess the big smile goes on that takes on thick <laughs> and it's a monster but yeah it's like a whole bizarre thing because sometimes maintaining that yeah. is a very scary thing I'm the man and I'm happy to be it's true you said about someone who's being on that people people want you to be a certain way and sometimes you can't help but be depressed or you know <laughs> <laughs> do I make yes. you nervous no you like yes you like me yes if you want us to leave, Don. What am this I? is one of those yes, no like a, interviews. It's like a horse. <laughs> it's astonishing how angry you can get on stage. And there are people who say uh, there's no such thing as a bad audience. And there can be an audience of clods and uh, dunderheads. Especially for comedians, sometimes they look upon them as, as lower than, you know. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a cro magnon like, oh, look, there's the geek boy. Yeah, yeah. And they treat them and they yell, you know, they scream stuff. They think most people, when they get a little bit drunk, and we see a comedian will. Start thinking, hey, well, he's got to learn to deal with it. <laughs> you know, just yell stuff. Does it disturb you that so many people know you and yes. grab you and recognize yeah. you? Yeah, you feel like a freak. Yeah, Do but you? He has to learn to deal with it. you got to relate to it like you're, you're running for Congress. I love it. It's wonderful. No, <laughs> I, 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 you really don't like it, do you? No, I don't like it. No. Comedy actor John Belushi died today in Los Angeles. John Belushi was 33. Jerry Bowen looks at the career of the man who topped his Saturday Night Live television success with such movies as Animal House and Neighbors. Belushi died at the Chateau Marmont, a Hollywood hotel favored by entertainers and rock stars. The cause of death reportedly natural causes. Two years ago, he got an award at UCLA, and the performance was pure Belushi. I feel funny about awards, you know? I, I like Emmys and Oscars and Grammys and all that, because you have to buy those. This, uh... John Belushi, dead today at the age of 33. Jerry Bowen, CBS News, Hollywood. Pick this up for an hour. Lauren Michaels, the original producer of Saturday Night Live, had this to say about Belushi's death. Not, not the tragedy. The tragedy is that he, you know, his life was uh, uh, was very full, and it was, uh, uh, and that it's it's been uh, stopped. Deputy District Attorney Michael Genlin said it was Kathy Evelyn Smith's statements to the National Enquirer that persuaded officials to take a hard second look at the Belushi case. And what we have in this article is the appearance of someone who is apparently confessing to potentially having committed second-degree murder and supplying, furnishing heroin. Why was this case given low priority just a few weeks after Belushi's death? Why was Kathy Smith released after just two hours of questioning? And why was at least one Hollywood celebrity named in that testimony not contacted? 
The essence of what I discovered was that the drugs that killed John Belushi came from the LAPD evidence locker. It was all a, 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 a we're trying to bust John Belushi that uh, Kathy Smith had had uh, made that she would uh, uh, keep the LAPD posted as to what was going on in the room that she was getting John high and she reported back that uh, well Robin Williams had dropped by and Robert De Niro had dropped by and whoever her contact was at the LAPD got a little bit greedy at that point and thought to themselves well gee it would be better if we could make a bigger bust uh, he asked uh, Kathy Smith if you know if there was any chance they were coming back she said well yes and could there be any other big stars coming by and she said yes and she was told well just you know Keep getting John High until any other stars show up, and when they do, give us a call, and we'll make a, a bigger bust. And so she kept getting John High until he died. And then she called them and said, hey, guess what? Your shit just killed John Belushi. And they said, don't move. And they showed up, and they told her to leave, come back in an hour. Uh, they cleaned up the room. Smith was on probation at the time of Belushi's death, the result of an earlier heroin arrest. Jenlin explained why she was not detained. Certainly at that time, she appeared cooperative. She did not appear that she would be evading any further questioning. She was apparently uh, giving free and voluntary statements. And uh, how long can you talk to somebody? Certainly a two and a half hour period is, uh, appeared sufficient at that time. But if you read the transcription of uh, Kathy Smith's questioning by the LAPD when she's eventually arrested, uh, for some reason, they literally never asked the question, where did the drugs come from? Uh, it's a question that never comes up at any point. Uh, and they didn't ask because they knew where it came from. It, it came from them. We determined uh, right from the outset that uh, it clearly looked like an overdose. Uh, and it was our, the investigator's judgment that uh, that overdose appeared to be uh, cocaine uh, and probably uh, injected. She had a case already in the works. She was uh, specifically given drugs from the LAPD evidence locker to, to promote, you know, a relationship with John Belushi or with the interests of getting him busted. Hollywood, the magnet that attracts all talent. Hopeful performers looking for their place on the big spotlight of fame is a rich field for the dirt gatherers of journalism. And when there is no news, they make it. And is it true that once people do talk to you, they don't eventually usually like what you print? And uh, because uh, the, the wife of John Belushi in your book, let's just have a quick look at it again. Yes. Um, actually says she doesn't even recognize her own husband from the book and she feels you've betrayed her. Well, she says that, and then she speaks out of the other side of her mouth and said uh, it turns out to have been worth it, and she would even do it again because maybe some people will have learned the lesson. Bob Woodward, it's fascinating business you're in, absolutely fascinating. I hope I never become one of your victims. It's 7.43, time for sport. Here's Richard Keyes. <laughs> he, he spoke with me about an hour and a half, and, uh, you know, there's things in there that I don't remember saying to him that, uh, and... Uh, First of all, the book, I've skimmed through excerpts of it. It's, it's really pulpy and trashy. It's not well written at all. And Bob Woodward, he was a man with a very respectable career. Deep Throat said, follow the money. In this case, I'm saying to him, please follow the drugs. Please, whatever you're doing here, just find out where the drugs came from. Can you do that? Come on, Bob Woodward, please. <laughs> because I believe the drugs came from. He said, well, how do you know that? And then... I told him the whole backstory of how I knew John. That's a depressing, sordid, tragic book. He jumps around the issue of the, the police probe and uh, the fact that some of the people that were purveying drugs to John were friends of police force members in Los Angeles. And uh, this is something that he wimped out on. And I have heard that he really didn't write most of the book, that it was John Anderson, the, uh, his researcher, who, who put down most of the material on paper. I met a Hollywood party somewhere. And I'm introduced to someone. And they go, oh, Michael Dare. Are you the Michael Dare who was in Wired? And I said, yes, I was. And she said, 
oh my God, I, I worked on that book. I went, really? And uh, this was a woman. She said, yeah, I was, uh, I was uh, a research assistant for Bob Woodard. And I said, really? Well, do you know why he didn't use my story? And she said, yes. And I said, oh, really? Okay, tell me. She said, the day that he was coming out to interview you, instead, he, uh, to have lunch with you, instead he had lunch with Daryl Gates who was the chief of police <laughs> yeah. of the LAPD. She said, until Bob Woodward had lunch with Daryl Gates, yours was the story we were telling. She told me that they had verified my version of events. That they had absolutely, they had three to four other people who had told the same story. Chief Gates said what happened to Bellucci is symptomatic of a larger problem. I think we're suffering a tragic loss, and I think uh, these things ought to be brought out. Uh, I'm kind of happy that the media is continuing with this story, because I think the more you talk about it, uh, the more it's going to call it to the public's attention uh, that we have a terrible problem. And uh, here's a terrible loss, a tragic loss, due to, for, for no reason at all, just uh, junk. Every decade needs a scary boogeyman to rally behind and blame all of our deep-rooted societal problems on. And in the 80s and into the 90s, the blanket term drugs was the 9-11 of the times. First Lady Nancy went from school to school telling children to just say no to all of these drugs with a t-shirt. Once she'd absorbed enough child's fear to energize herself, Nancy would swing into the occasional rehab center to gather horrible tales of people. She then shared these horror stories with all of America, which in turn made the whole country say, hell no, to people who said, hell yes, to drugs. Today, there's a drug and alcohol abuse epidemic in this country, and no one is safe from it. And the plan worked. A boogeyman was created. The Reagan administration's pulverizing advocacy for anti-drug causes resulted in 64% of Americans in 1985 believing drugs were the number one issue in the nation. Sorry, AIDS. Mr. Caesar will be sitting in that great big jacuzzi in the sky, and I'll control both sides of the equation. Uh -huh, sure, but just like every other foaming rabid psycho in this city with a foolproof plan, you've forgotten you're facing the single finest fighting force ever assembled. The Israelis? I remember a big media event it was the first ride of the Bataram, and uh, Nancy Reagan rode shotgun. You wish that, uh, wish that somehow you could have, somebody could have gotten a hold of them sooner. So you had Nancy Reagan sitting next to uh, Daryl Gates conducting what was, in essence, urban warfare. It just got scandalous. On this week's Super Train Mystery, hail to the chief. Two dwarfs and a magician replace a presidential candidate with a double so real. Open your eyes to a wonderful show. Had to put the color ads. Like. Oh, what a feeling. Big savings now on all Hoover cleaners. Hoover cleaners. Right now. You use your nasal spray again. Again and again because congestion keeps coming back. In clinical tests, new Unisom help people feel drowsy, so they fell asleep faster. The Other Side of the Mountain, Part 2. The continuation of the true story of paralyzed ex-skier Jill Kenmont. Effective and safe. Read label directions. Medicines can't help you. Look, honey, there's your ring. Look, Grandpa, there's your ring. You've got a ring around the collar. Oh, those did. That the original Ghostbusters was originally intended for John Belushi. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I was writing it for, for Eddie Murphy uh, and John Belushi and myself. Why not John? Why didn't he take the part? Well, when I was writing the line for him, I got the call that he had died. Now, you might be seeing some black and white footage, and of course, you know this is a work print. And uh, we're going to try to show you little bits of the film and uh, get you excited. We certainly are. And, and if that doesn't work, we have... 117 girls who are looking for scholarships to nursing school. They'll be circulating through your rooms over the next day or so. Al Franken went to bungalow number uh, three where John died and spent a night there. And he said that John sat on the bed next to him and was and appeared to him vividly for at least two minutes. He's a newspaper man with a big name in a big city. I know what really happened on Murphy Street. And if I know, pretty soon Chicago will. I don't know what you're talking about. Enjoy a dessert! He has friends in high places. He gets vacations he didn't even ask for. 
What is this? Some kind of a blackmail scheme? Let's say I'm offering you a bargain on some very artistic pictures. It was one person who said they heard it from someone who put me on the phone with them. Mm. Uh, and it was someone who was uh, uh, intimately involved. Someone who uh, told me that they were in bed with the police officer and overheard the conversations uh, between him and Kathy Smith. We know that Columbia is charging a lot of money for this. We heard this. It was our idea. but. There are some perks. You'll be able to have the successful comedy, and you'll be able to meet someone special back in your room in just a few minutes, as soon as this meeting's over. That's right. All taken care of by the good people over at Columbia Pictures, subsidiary of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola Bottling Company. Ghostbusters. I spent uh, about an hour and 45 minutes before the Senate of the United States uh, testifying on the progress of uh, narcotic problem in the United States, and uh, you might know they would pick up uh, one little comment. And then after me, they said, did you mean it? Yeah, I mean it. Let me tell you why. How would any of you, even today, feel about those who give aid and comfort to Iraq? We have a war, a shooting war, not in the Middle East right now. We have it on the streets of every major city in this country. And you know who's feeding and supporting the enemy? The casual drug user. Do you think that the, the drug use in the rock world is as bad as, as people think, or do you think it's totally exaggerated? It's as bad as drug use in the legal profession, in government, in medicine. It's as bad as drug use among uh, housewives, maybe even among police officers. I, I think that the potential for harm of cocaine has been exaggerated. Now, this doesn't mean to say that what Leslie says is not true. It is, but it, it bears the same kind of relationship as alcohol and social drinking does to alcoholism. I mean, people can use cocaine and use it moderately and intelligently and not get into difficulty. But it is a drug which can be abused, and people who abuse it just as, you know, five to 10% of people who drink become abused, uh, become alcoholics. Uh, certainly there are people who, uh, who abuse cocaine and they can, they can uh, certainly uh, harm themselves. It starts out as a party drug you know, and everybody's passing it around, and you end up in a room by yourself with the windows closed and the curtains drawn and looking out the window. I mean, you hear all kinds of sounds. Um, I've known people to feed inanimate objects, such as trees. I mean, you, you go a little nuts. It sounds, you know, funny, but it's, it's real. It's all real. And meanwhile, the police have got to enforce a law that hundreds of thousands of people in the city are breaking. What do you got there, Lieutenant? About an ounce of cocaine. Can I see? Sure. And this was hidden where? Inside the residence here. We'll show you where it was hidden at right. a later time. It's about $2,200 an ounce. It sells them about $200 a gram. So you've uh, raided one small-time pusher this evening. How many more hundreds and hundreds like that are there in, in Los Angeles? be a thousands in Los Angeles. They're winning. From the beginning of next year, California state law will ban the open sale of freebasing and dealer's equipment like this. The move is not expected to have much effect on the cocaine epidemic. Alcohol became legal after prohibition. Marijuana has become almost legal after the clampdowns of the 60s. It's pretty good. Could the same really happen to a drug like cocaine? Police officers and other um, civic officials are less likely to punish a kid for being drunk than they are for drugs. And the reason why uh, people get arrested for marijuana usage or whatever is because I believe the government is involved in the drug traffic. I think that the government wants drugs in the marketplace because it keeps people stupid. And occasionally they arrest just the guy on the street. They don't get the big guys. 
you know, because the big guys are already working for the government. They're all shaking hands, you know, the pyramid goes up like this, and at the top, whoop, it's the same guy. The one who sells the dope and the guy who says, go arrest this one. It's just a, a, bad, uh, a bad substance generally, and I'll speak out against drug abuse when the U.S. Air Force starts forcing down the smugglers' planes. It's a billion-dollar industry. What, what, what can I do? And Barry Seal had another agenda. Pilot Terry Reed claims Seal hired him in 1983 to train Contra pilots at this remote airstrip north of Mina. In 1984, Seal was arrested for smuggling and was turned by the Drug Enforcement Administration into an informant and smuggler for the government. With help from both Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North and the CIA, Seal pulled off a spectacular drug sting. He flew his own C-123 to Nicaragua, where he took these pictures of Sandinistas helping load Colombian cocaine onto his plane. I believe that his war against organized crime, his war against drugs, uh, has been nothing more than a charade in a public relations campaign, and I think that the evidence is clear on that. That there were the people who were selling uh, drugs uh, to purchase weapons for the Contras as part of their Ilya Mocenary activity. And then there were those who were more mercenary about it, selling drugs for profit, using the Contras as a, uh, as a cover for their operation. I, I will tell you, Director Deutsch, as a former Los Angeles police narcotics detective, that the agency has dealt drugs throughout this country for a long time. <laughs> Director Deutsch, I will refer you to three specific agency operations known as Amadeus, Pegasus, and Watchtower. I have Watchtower documents heavily redacted by the agency. I was personally exposed to CIA operations and recruited by CIA personnel who attempted to recruit me in the late 70s. I'll tell you something, this crack was bought right here in the White House. <laughs> three feet from this desk. <laughs> it's bad, bad. <laughs> Walk through a party in the county jail. Prison man's there, they began to wail. Prison man's there, they began to swing. Shut her and I died, jail, but I ring, let it rock. Everybody let it rock. Everybody in the old step down. What they had to do, the dead how to rock. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do it as well as Andy Kaufman. He does it much better. Hey, folks, here's a story about Minnie the Moocher. She was a red, a hot, huge chicken. She was the roughest, toughest friend. Minnie had a heart as big as a whale. You win.